good morning. We want to welcome you all to, to Hope First Baptist Church this morning as we gather together on this beautiful Sunday morning to, to worship our Lord and Savior. Uh, especially want to welcome any guests that are here with us today. Thank you for coming and worshiping with us today. Just a couple of uh, quick announcements. Uh, just a reminder to the men, next Saturday morning at 7.30 is men's breakfast at Duck Creek Gardens. So uh, come and be prepared to be filled with food and, and filled with devotion as, as Dennis leads us. So, so again, uh, plan on that next Saturday morning, men, at 7.30 at Duck Creek Gardens. The other thing, it, it's hard to imagine already, but you know, next week begins July, and that means you know, school starting just, just shortly. So what I want to do for the month of July is uh, invite you, ask you to purchase school supplies uh, so we can shower the, the teachers with school supplies. The teachers back to school luncheon will be uh, first part of August sometime. More information coming on that in just a little bit. But uh, to buy paper and notebooks and folders and pencils and colored pencils and, and all the stuff that uh, we need to, to fill the, the, um, the larders for school, that, that they can have school supplies, Kleenexes, uh, Clorox wipes, all that. So keep that in mind as you're shopping through the month of July. Please bring those in, and we can fill that counter out there and, and hopefully another table or two. So thank you for that. Will you join me in prayer this morning, please? Under Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning that we can come and gather here in this room that you have provided for us. Dear Lord, we come that we... We're thankful that we can come in, in freedom and worship without fear, dear Lord. We thank you for those brave men and women so many years ago that um, set forth to create us, this country. This country that was founded upon you. We pray, dear Lord, that, that your leading would still be upon this country. We pray for the leaders that govern us. We pray for the people of this country, dear Lord, that, that you would sustain them. We thank you, dear Lord, for just the many ways that you work in our lives. We thank you for your healing touch upon those that, that have been sick. We pray for and we thank you for your sustaining grace upon those that are facing ongoing health issues, dear Lord, that you would continue to, to be with them as, and travel with them as they walk down this road. There are concerns upon our heart this morning, dear Lord, and we, we pray for, for each and every one of those. <clears throat> you know what they are continued healing, dear Lord, not only of, of body, but of mind and of spirit. We think of this morning that the families of two young men from Jennings County High School that were killed in a traffic accident. We just pray, dear Lord, that you would visit those families. Dear Lord, that you would be with the school system and the students through this next week. We pray for others in our community, dear Lord, that have lost loved ones. We just pray your hand of comfort, your arms be wrapped securely around them that they may feel your very presence. We thank you, dear Lord, for being there for us when we need you. We thank you, dear Lord, that you sent your son to us that you thought enough of us that you sent him to us to save us we thank you again that we can come and we can worship here you 
May our worship to you be pleasing. May our hearts be focused only on you, that you and you alone would be glorified. Amen. I lost it. Forgot where I was going. How about this? Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Will you stand with me this morning as we sing?
breath so I could praise your great and matchless name all my days, all my days. So let my whole life be a blazing offering, a life that shouts and sings the greatness of our Bless you, bless you. Turn around somebody and bless them. Just the blessing, church. Uh, before service, the worship team, we always pray. And uh, Melissa was praying for you guys today. And she said she hopes that you are like 465. That you're continually working on yourself. <laughs> yeah. Um, the next couple of weeks, I want to encourage you, bring, uh, bring a written Bible. There's a real interesting thing, if you study that way, there's this real new thing they've done is they've actually put the Bible in print form. <laughs> it's out there. You can find it like all kinds of places, right? Uh, but I don't use, I hardly, the only time I use this print Bible is when I preach to you uh, because I found that my phone has so many more adaptive and easy to get to things, and so I use it that way. Uh, but for the next couple of weeks, I'm actually going to be kind of preaching from the Bible. I was in Russia a couple of years ago. I lost my Bible. Didn't know it for three days. And uh, it became my turn to preach again. I go, I don't even have a Bible. And uh Get with some preachers, lose your Bible, and see what kind of stuff you have to take from them. Oh, yeah. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, uh, so that you can look on it, we'll keep the big Bible going on, and you might want to mark. I tried marking my phone. Uh, it didn't work real well. But they actually have apps that will do that. But the next couple of uh, weeks, I am going to exegete. I'm just going to take some, script, uh, some scriptures and just go down through them and and actually hit some Hebrew wording uh, and say here is what this means. There's an overarching thought behind what I'm going to be doing. For me, there are 10 thoughts behind what I'm going to be doing. Now, there's an overarching thought, and it is this idea of hope in God. Uh, Paige, maybe you could make a big uh, a, uh, um, slide to go back here that says hope in God. 
okay? Uh, but I'm, I want to look at the wisdom literature. I want to look at Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes on the word hope. And we might go into the New Testament and just look at the theology of hope. Because I'm going to tell you, I never studied hope until I moved to hope. And I go, I live in hope. I don't know what hope is. I want to know what hope is. Somebody wrote a song. Oh, no, that was love. Uh, and, and so I, I really never thought about it. Uh, but a couple of years ago, I did a deep dive into that word in the Bible. And now I'm doing the second deep dive and going just a little bit deeper. But the next couple of weeks, what I want to do is say, let's hope in God. And, uh, and uh, I have a friend, and I, I tried to steal it. Uh, but he just, he just does it so well, I can't do it. He calls himself a hope dealer. And he used to be a dope dealer. Uh, but, uh, but he wears the chains. He's got red pants that come down to here. And he wears his hat sideways. He works in the city of Indianapolis. But he just, and, and his van says hope dealer on it. And it, it, it goes, I used to pedal dope. Now I pedal hope. It's really, it's really good. And he's, he's a for real, for real hope dealer, okay? Okay. Uh, and so uh, I, I just got a stationary bike. I call myself a hope peddler. <laughs> I'm not a dealer. I'm a peddler. I'm not really going anywhere, but I got hope. Uh, now, I, I want to look at it, and, uh, and I'm going to begin today. Uh, I'm going to go a little bit dark, and at the end we'll end light, something I don't like to talk about, but I think you need to talk about from time to time. And I'm going to talk about the devil. I'm going to talk about spiritual warfare. I want you to know that every thought that comes into your mind is not your thought. I want you to know that every act that happens to you does not begin in time. It begins in eternity. There really is true evil in the world. There is a visible realm. There is an invisible realm. The invisible realm influences the visible realm in very negative ways. Okay, we're going to start off there, and we're going to start in the book of Job, but we're going to start with what I think is uh, a very important scripture, and it talks about there is security in hope. And, it's, and it is the guy that is going through the worst spiritual attack that the Bible reveals, but right in the middle of it, it goes, there is security in hope. Hope is security, okay? The word hope in, one of the words for hope in Hebrew, which is what the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, one of those words means rope or cord. And I really like Hebrew 6 because it says our hope is anchored in heaven and hope is the cord that ties the security of heaven to the human life. Isn't that amazing? How many people know God's never going to be dethroned? Okay, his throne, the Bible says, is established forever. Every kingdom that can be shaken will be shaken. His kingdom cannot be shaken, therefore, it can't be. Sh there is no shaking in God's eternal world. And he goes, and there's something called hope that makes you as secure in this world as you will be in that world. Amen. Isn't that like super good news? And it is written to a guy that's going through the worst spiritual attack in Scripture. The, or, or, or at least the most open spiritual attack in Scripture. Okay? And we want to talk about that. Put it on pause just for a second while I tell you a story. And we're going to... Uh, the story will have a meaning. I'll come back to where I'm preaching, and I'll show you where the first story has a meaning in the second. Uh, there's a guy. He's in the airport. He's, his flight's going to go off pretty soon. Uh, he's texting. Has anybody ever noticed is when you're the busiest is when your phone goes off the words? Has anybody else ever done like me? You're texting two different people, and you text the wrong person the wrong thing. Yeah, I was doing that one time, texting with my wife and a teenage girl in uh, our church, and I invited the teenage girl in our church on to a date. And she knew that that wasn't the right kind of thing, so she called me on it. If, if your pastor ever invites you on a date, call him on it immediately. And, uh, and I said, oh, I thought I was talking to uh, my wife. And she goes, okay, I'm going to give my dad to get some pointers off of you, okay? Okay. Uh, 
so have you ever done that? You're texting one, you're, and, and so the guy's busy, he's texting, and uh, lo and behold, from the God of the heavens, there's a, a, Dun- a Dunkin' Donut a kiosk. Stops by, gets coffee. Anybody ever heard of Dunkin' Donut, Donut Halls? Yeah, they're from heaven. Uh, he grabs a bag. He goes, he sets his bag down and, and uh, his coat down. He's going to take his coffee and his donuts. He's headed over to a table. Can't find a table. There's a table with somebody else sitting at it. Uh, some people like to talk to people in airports, my wife. Uh, and those are others of us that are a little bit more introverted. We like the back of our phone to say, don't talk to me. And we look at it. And and so the guy, and he sits down. Other guys across the table from him. Maybe I can avoid the guy. He's busy on his phone. And uh, he he takes a sip of his coffee, Dunkin' Donut, good as it always is. Uh, takes one of his uh, donuts out of the bag. And the other guy reaches over and takes a donut out of his bag. Can you say rude? That's why this guy is rude. And uh, so the next donut hole he goes for, he just moves the bag over by his cup. And the guy reaches over, gets the bag, pulls it, takes another one out. Dude loves donuts. And now he's kind of like, mm. and uh, he sees the guy look at his watch. He's getting ready to go get his plane, and uh, there's one donut hole left, and the guy reaches in the bag, breaks the donut hole, hands him half, and smiles. And now he's livid. He's off. I'm not eating your grubby-handed donut. I don't even know you. What in the world are you doing? And now he's kind of agitated. It's time for his flight. He just takes the donut, the bag, everything, throws it away, goes over, picks up his coat, and there is his bag of donuts. <laughs> and then he looks up and he goes, I thought the guy was stealing, but what he was doing was sharing. God owns all the donuts. <laughs> when we pass the plate, and you, <laughs> Larry, and God enables you to work and works with you to provide, huh? And He gives us 10 donuts, and we just give God a donut back, right? And we don't pass the plate around here because COVID said, oh, we don't have to do it that way. We could do it another way. But we have a plate in the back when you come in or go out if you want to give like that. And uh, Larry has on our website if you want to give like that. Uh, A friend of mine said it like this. I go, that's just amazing. And he had everybody in the congregation take out a dollar. That won't work these days because nobody takes cash. And some people just take out a bill. Some people had tens or hundreds or fives. And and he encouraged us, look at the bill. And, And then here's what he said. Every bill in every hand in this place has been used for sinful reasons in America. Do you think that would be true? If each of us had money, that money has been used. He goes, now it comes to us, and what we do is we redeem it. Huh? We give it, and three things happen when you give, and you bring... uh, uh, extra stuff in for kids and lunches and teachers so they don't have to bite out of their pocket. Three things happen. And here's my favorite. I'm sorry. It's just my favorite is we destroy hell. When you sow, the enemy has all kinds of strategies and ideas. And when you sow into the kingdom, you destroy the works of the devil. I like that one. Uh, Secondly, we help humanity. So we destroy the devil. We help humanity And thirdly, we glorify God. And I know the third one's the most important one, and I want to glorify God. I I like that destroying the devil thing. (laughs) Don't you? And and, and so here's where I'm going to go in just a minute. Because we're going to read the Bible and look at it. Let me tell you what the enemy of your soul will do. There's a couple strategies. I'll show them to you. Here's what the enemy of your soul will do. He will try to destroy you. If he can't get you, he'll go after your kids. 
in the book of Job, it's a man. He goes after the man's kids. In Revelation 12, it's a woman. He goes after the woman's kids. He goes, if I can't get you, I'll get your kids. Because here's what I know. It's not personal. I hate God. God loves humans. I'm going after you. Not personal. I'm going after you because God loves you. Right? Now, I can't get to you. I have, I have watched and I have seen. You love your kids. I can't get to you. I'll get your kids. Huh? And we're, we're going to see this in the Bible. There are two things that will be close to, to a human heart that the, that the enemy will say, let me attack these things. I'll get to that heart. One is family, people close to you, people you love. And the second is your resources. I can't tell you, because I know men and I know me, I can't tell you the sleepless nights in this room by the men in this room that felt like they were not going to be able to provide for their families. It's the number one thing that will keep a man awake at night. is not, I won't be able to provide. And the enemy knows that. Right, So what he'll do is go after provision and go after people that you love and people that love you. If, if you got an amen on that and you've been saved for more than five years, would you just raise your hand and go, that means he's telling you the truth. Would you raise your hand? Yeah, you can. some people, she's like into it. An amen and both hands up. Yes, that's absolutely true. Okay, and we're going to get to the scripture. What would it be like if... You knew all your resourcing and your family was secure forever. Woo! That'd be it. Would be a, it would be a release on the soul, wouldn't it? Uh, let me show you what you're going to see in the Bible. There's a guy that the enemy God blesses him, and the enemy goes after everything close to the guy to get to the guy. And it doesn't work. He pulls every tree. He hits him the hardest he can hit. One of the worst days of my life was a high school playground. And uh, cut this, edit this, Larry. Uh, it was a high school playground. And I knew that a, a, a schoolyard fight was coming. And I just hit a guy as hard as I could. Everything I had. And he looked at me and smiled. And I'm not telling you the rest of the story. It's a deflating feeling. <laughs> huh? How about if the enemy hits you with everything he had? There was no restriction. He just hits you with everything. And you looked at him and smiled. You go, that's impossible. And I'm going to tell you it's not impossible. If two things are real, you are secure in your relationship with God, A, you're secure in the resources God has for you and you're secure that God can take care of those that you love. Uh, and so here's a story in a nutshell, then we'll read one chapter of it. There's a guy who lives right before the Lord. He lives right before the Lord, the Lord blesses him. He becomes the richest Guy, one of the richest guys in the world, at least the richest guy in that part of the world that nobody, no one knows anybody richer than this guy. He has a bunch of kids. He loves God. Here's what he does. Now his money's making money. See, see, rich people do this. They they work till they make money. Then they send their soldiers out to get more money. And then their soldiers get money, and now they are living off the money that their money makes. Uh, and the kingdom works like that. It works like that. Is we give to God, God blesses it. Then we send those soldiers out. They destroy the devil. They help people. They glorify God. It's a good thing, right? And so... Uh, God blesses the guy, richest guy he knows about. Every day he worships God, prays for his kids, and has an enjoyable life. In one day, and I'll show you the enemy. I'm going to show you the main thing I want you to know is what the enemy thinks about you. Because let me tell you, the devil, your, your thoughts toward the devil, they aren't. Pretty much he's not in your mind. You don't think about the devil a whole lot, right? 
nobody sits around, don't, don't sit around and think about the devil a whole lot. It'd be really good to sit around and think about Jesus a whole lot. You don't think about him. And what happens is he will, he will move you in passivity toward him. And here's what I like to say. I, I only look at the devil to pull the trigger and then get my mind back on God. Right? But there are times I need to recognize this is, this is from the enemy. It needs to be dealt with as if it is from the enemy. So here, here's the story of the guy. The enemy, the devil, in one day, he goes from being the richest, let's call him the richest man in the region, richest man in the world, most likely. He goes from being the richest man in the world in 24 hours to having absolutely nothing. He didn't have a kid die one day. He had all 10 of his children die in one day. And watch this. The enemy did not take his grieving wife. Because the grieving wife now blames God and blames him for serving God, and she stays there to be a torture to his soul. Loses everything. Then he gets sick. He is so sick that he can't, he talks about things, can't lift his head up, his body on fire with fever. He has boils that he scrapes with a knife. Somebody say gross. While he has the fever, while his, his limbs are so swollen that he cannot walk, while he's grieving the loss of his children, while he's living under the pressure of, I was successful and now I'm a total failure. You want me to tell you the rest of the story? That'd be a bad story if it ended right there. But the rest of the story is God defeated the work of the devil in his life. The rest of the story is God blessed him once, then God blesses him again. Come on. And the last book, you need to read Job 1, 2, and 42. When you read 42, what you find is, by the, at the end of the book, God gives him back double everything the devil stole. So he's the richest man in the world, the poorest man in the world, and the double richest man in the world. And then God goes, okay, devil tried to take your life. He stole from you seven years, eight years, whatever it was. God goes, I'm going to put a blessing on your life to extend your days until your new children have grandchildren. It's right there in the Bible. When your new children have grandchildren, I'll take you on to heaven. But I'm going, let me say it like this. I'm going to shove it in the devil's face for treating you like that. And I'm going to let you become wealthy, your kids become wealthy, and your grandkids become wealthy, and be happy, and serve me, and make the devil watch it happen on the earth till I get done, and then I'll just go ahead and take you to heaven. Amen. Isn't that good news? Anybody want to be double wealthy? God, you forgot the first one. Just give me the second one. Huh? Watch this, guys. Watch this. And here's what. Here is the truth of that scripture. The thing that sustained me in the down years was hope because I was secure in hope in the inner man because God is my hope. You can take my money, you can attack my children, you can take my stuff, but you cannot take the hope that is within me and the hope that is within me is a security of eternity that will make me strong until the blessing of the Lord comes over me. Isn't that good news? I'm just like, mm. okay, let me, and we're going to read it, but let me uh, say two things. Number one is Job never read the book of Job. Can I say that again? That's pretty deep thought. Some of you might want to write that down, think over it. I had to think about that for about four or five days. I finally came up with something profound. Job never read the book of Job. 
Therefore, he did not know it was the devil doing it to him. He thought it was God. The enemy tortures him in chapter 1 and chapter 2, but from chapter 2 to chapter 42, the greatest torture is in his mind, he thinks it's God doing it to him. And all the arguments of his friends and all of his counter arguments are, God should not be doing this to me. I did the right thing. And his enemies are going, no, you're not right. And he goes, I'm right. And I've had stupid preachers, i.e. stupid preachers. I've heard stupid preachers say, well, Job was just self-righteous. And I go, you need to read the Bible. Because three times God called Job righteous. And then when Job goes, I'm righteous, he was not being self-righteous. He was saying about himself what God said about him. Huh? Let me, I'll show you in the Bible. The devil will attack you for no good reason because that's who he is. Huh? And then the number one thing he's going to do is to blame God for what he does. And then people will get mad at God for what the devil did, and I want to help you. There is no remedy for that. You cannot be fixed, helped, encouraged, get over your anxiety. There is no hope for you if you blame God for what the devil does. But here's what you can do. You can change your mind and blame it on the devil. <laughs> and then God will be behind you. And when you get there, now all heaven is open to you. It will never be open to you blaming God for what the devil did. Hmm? And we go, oh, God did it. God did it. God did it. And, and uh, Job goes, the Lord gives. Anybody remember it? The Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's a great attitude. Keep that attitude. It's bad theology. God never took one thing from Job. It's in the Bible. The devil took it from him. But he goes, even if I lose everything, I've not lost my hope in God. And my hope in God will secure me until everything writes itself before him. Isn't that good news? Good news. We'll read it. You, you write down these three things and don't ever forget them. Don't ever forget these three things. It is the devil's attitude toward you. Don't ever forget the devil's attitude toward you. say some things particular ways so that next week yeah we'll unwrap them I'm going to say them this way number one is the devil thinks you're worthless when it comes to humanity he has absolutely no value for a human The devil inspires the rape and mutilation of children because a human being is like a mosquito is to you, to him. If you kill a mosquito, I doubt that there's much mourning over the killing of mosquitoes in this room. And I doubt that you named it, looked at it, oh, wondered what its children were like. What did you go? Mosquito, worthless. The devil looks at humanity and goes worthless. No value. Humanity to him has one purpose. God loves you, therefore I will destroy you to hurt the heart of God. You're worthless. Number two, it's always good to know what your enemy thinks about you. It's good. Number two, the devil truly believes. He's not faking it. 
It's in the Bible. He truly believes that you are weak and he will break your will. That's what he believes. The first step of it is get you to passivity toward God. Uh, I have a son that can choke you out seven different ways. He can. <laughs> Not me because I run. No. No, 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 no. And it, it's called a chain of submissions. And what he will do is put you in one position. You have four things you can do, and he's going to choke you no matter what you do, and he will let you choose what you're going to do. And he'll say, you just choose how you lose. I don't care. Because I have you in this compromised place right here, no matter what you do, you're going to sleep. The enemy's goal is to get you toward passivity toward God. When you get passive toward God, he will destroy you. And here's what he knows. You are weak. And all I have to do is get you passive toward God. Here's what he really believes. You're not strong enough to stop me. Number three. Here's what the devil believes. He believes you're selfish. You know that the devil tells God that you're selfish? And here's what he goes. Your greatest weakness is your selfishness. Because you're selfish, I will push you into passivity toward God. When I get you passive toward God because you're selfish, I've seen so many people Prayed to God to give them a job. Anybody ever heard about that one? What do they do when they get the job? You've heard of it before, haven't you? Come on. You quit serving God. I I served God till he gave me a job. I prayed for the job. He gave me the job. Now I don't have time to serve God. Anybody ever heard of it before? Here's what the devil said. You're selfish. Start serving God. Now I will push And I'm not talking about not coming to church on Sunday morning because you got a job. Do that. Then tithe. Put it in the money. We'll all live off of it or something. Now, uh, please don't hear what I'm not saying. Somebody go to work on Sunday. I say something like that. No, no, I better quit my job. And your husband's going, don't quit your job. (laughs) That's not it. What I'm talking about now, God goes way in the background and the thing I want comes in the foreground. Does that make sense? That's the enemy using selfishness to get you to passivity toward God when you get passive toward God he goes you are a worth and it'll start out like this you're the most beautiful thing in the world it's the seduction of the enemy to tell you how much you're worth and then draw you into his true thought you are worthless and I will kill you destroy your life make you I will torture you and put you in torment because every time you're in torment, it hurts God. And I don't care about you, but I care to hurt God. You think I'm being weird, and I'm not being weird. Hmm? And he had a big problem with a guy named Job because Job was not selfish. And because Job was not selfish, he could not be controlled. Here's what Jesus said. I came to lay my life down. If you will follow me and lay your life down too, you will be victorious all the way to heaven because the devil cannot control humble, selfless people. Because every attack is against pride and selfishness. And here's what he believes about humanity. He says it to God. I'll read it to you in the Bible. They are worthless They are weak, and they are selfish. And here's what Jesus came to do, and there is nothing the enemy can do about it. 
Jesus came to lay down his life for you because he thinks you're worth it. And in my weakness, I become strong through the power of Christ in me. And now I have the worth that God thinks. See, God thinks you're worth it. God thinks you're strong. And God believes that the Son of God inside you can cause you to live a selfless life for the good of others. That's what God believes. Isn't that amazing? How many people think that's just amazing? And you go, and you go, I can never be put in a compromised situation where I go passive toward God if I don't live selfish. That's like cool. You want to read it in the Bible? Let's read the Bible in the next hour and a half that we have together. Now, I just want to take the book of Job. Uh, let's look at, uh, uh, let's look at uh, 18, uh, uh, what is that, uh, 11, 18, yeah. And you would be secure because there is hope. And Job goes, I'll live through all of it secure because I have hope and my hope's in God. Does that make sense? Okay, let's read Job 1. We'll read it uh, quickly. Anybody remember standardized testing? I'll, I'll read aloud while you read silently looking at your book. No, there is a the spotlight's going to do this. The spotlight of the scripture is going to shine on a man. It's going to tell you about the man. And then it's going to shine into the invisible and go, here's what's going on behind the scenes. Does that make sense? Okay, so it starts out, there's a man from us. And if you want to live in overcoming spiritual life, three different times, God explains Job to the devil. And he goes, Job has these four qualities. And what he's saying is, my guy can beat you. Here's the four qualities he's going to beat you with. I'll tell you what they are, and he will still beat you because you cannot overcome these four qualities. Have a question. When the enemy accuses you to God, what do you think God says about you? There are four things that God says about Job. He never says them in time. He says them in eternity. He never says them to men. He says them to the devil. There are four things God says about Job that I believe if we would pursue these four things, they would secure spiritual victory forever. It's the first thing God says about Job. God goes, I see Job. Here's what I see. Here's quality number one. He is righteous. He is right in his heart with me. He's righteous. Violate your conscience toward God. You step into the trap of the devil. But God says of Job, number one, he's righteous. Number two, he's upright. Righteous is internal, upright's external. He's right with God, and he does what's right all the time. Man, isn't that a good testimony? Guys, think about this. This is not Job giving his testimony. This is God giving Job's testimony to the devil. This is deep. <laughs> God goes, I know him inside out, daylight dark. I know what he thinks, I know what he feels, I know how he acts. He says to the devil, you just surveil him from the outside. I know him inside and out. Here's what I know. He's righteous. He's upright. He's righteous. He's upright. Number three, he fears God. That means he lives in all of God. Number four, he hates evil. He's righteous, upright, fears God, hates evil. I think those are good. What do you think? <laughs> ah, I want to save my preach and be very tactical, but I'm going to be emotional. And my tactical would be to take you through the story 
Come to the end. Save it till the end so you're interested and then give it. But I, I can't wait. Here's what I want you to know. Jesus Christ came to destroy the works of the devil. 1 John 3, 8, for this purpose was the Son of Man manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. When he came and died on the cross, he made you righteous with God. You do not have to be a Job-like guy trying to be right with God. He who knew no sin became sin for you that you might become the righteousness of God in Christ. Now, because you're righteous, he will enable you by his spirit to live upright in all things. You're going to do the right thing when you couldn't do the right thing. You tried to do the the right thing. You did the wrong thing. Paul's the guy that writes it. He tried, I tried to be good. Then I seen I was killing people. And I just, every time I tried to do right, I couldn't do right. Then I found out he died for me. Found out he died for me. He jumped inside me. And now I live upright before God because Christ enables me to be upright. He goes, now I'm filled with all of God because the God of all, all is now inside me. Because he is inside me, I'm able to discern good from evil. I hate evil. I move away from it and toward the good of God. Isn't that good news? I think it's good news. We'll read the rest of it. Say amen in two minutes. You ready? Watch this. He has sons. I, I like this. He has 7,000 sheep. Poor Job. 3,000 camels. Everybody else trying to find a camel. He goes, I got 3,000 of them. 500 yoke of oxen. Anybody know what a yoke is? What is it? How to? How many does he have, Tom? He has 1,000 oxen. A very large, you see where it says household? It, here's that word in Hebrew. Barns, grain, implements, combines, everything that he needs to take care of that is in his household. Somebody think that's a pretty good compound. Good day. Now let's see what he does. Uh, at four, his sons would go and feast in their houses. That means his sons got houses. He's got ten, he's got seven sons, three daughters, ten households that he's providing for. They go feast in their homes. He works, they feast. Right there. Each one appointed day would send and invite their sisters to come eat. And so when the days were on the coast, Job would send and sanctify them. He'd rise early in the morning, offer offerings to God. Job said, maybe one of my kids sinned. I just want them to be right with God. Okay, six. There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before them. And that sons of God means angels. Angels are presenting themselves before the Lord. Now, now you're seeing an eternal realm. Uh, I just run through it. I pretty much told the story. But the Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? And Satan answered, from going to and fro on the earth, walking about. Anybody who's read uh, the New Testament, what's he doing? in the New Testament. Roaming about. Doing what, Melissa? Does anybody remember? Like a hungry lion. He's roaming about like a hungry lion seeking what? Whom he may devour. Hmm. There are a lot of people going to go from Indiana to Florida in the summertime. I, I pray the Lord bless them. Thank God I'm not one of them. Why are they moving? To, why are they moving about to Florida? Why are they moving? Why are they going? <laughs> huh? Why is somebody going to Arizona? Uh, here's me. Why is somebody going to Alaska? Huh? They are they are moving for a purpose. What's the purpose? Vacation, fun, shop. They have a purpose. Why does the devil move? It's right there in the Bible. He has one goal. Let me seek and let me. Destroy. Here's what I want you to know. You can live like it's not happening if you want. Please know there is real 
evil that is simply looking for a place to land. The minute you begin to doubt God, he goes, there's a good landing strip. The minute you start going, and here's what he'll tell you, God's bad. And then he'll say to God, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we can see it in the Bible. Melissa's bad. <laughs> Not Melissa. Yeah, she eats too many cookies all the time. It's just like the worst sin ever. Huh? No, God is telling or the enemy is telling God how bad Melissa is and telling Melissa how bad God is. Anybody ever known anybody like that? They'll get right between two people, tell them one story, then another story, and they're a stirrer of stuff. Huh? Uh, anybody ever know drama queens? Anybody ever heard of a drama queen? You've known three of them in your lifetime. Go in here. What are they looking for? Here's an opportunity for you. I had somebody tell me one time, they're a Christian. They were in church. They go, I gossip. They committed it. And they go, and I told this person something to see what they would say bad about that person. I go, you're, I'm your pastor. Don't tell me that. <laughs> I'm not playing. They go, that person would just never talk about anybody because I tried to get them to talk about somebody one time. I told them once, and now she's into her story so much, she forgets she's talking to her pastor. <laughs> And I tried to tell them something about, watch this. He is looking for an opportunity for you to say, yeah, you're right. God's not good. Let me tell you what he will never find. God to say about you that you're not good. It ain't going to happen. <laughs> Do you see it? The audacity of the devil, watch this. Have you considered Job? Then, <laughs> from, uh, again, the Lord said to servant, my servant Job, there's none like him on the earth. He's blameless, he's upright, he fears God. And Satan answered and says, now look, he goes, God, you're not right. Did you see the deception in that? No, God, you're not right. Job does not serve you because he's a good guy. Job serves you because you bless him. And then it starts. You stop blessing him, he'll stop serving you. See, see, here's what you did. You gave him a bunch of stuff. He don't love you, he loves the stuff. You take the stuff away, he won't worship you anymore. Forget that righteous God-fearing thing. He's righteous and God-fearing because you blessed him. Now, God doesn't say this to everybody. But he had a real testimony over Job's life. And he said, okay, take his stuff. Devil comes back. Hey, devil, how about that stuff thing? And he goes, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, he, didn't, he didn't fall because he took it. But you've watched over his kid, given him kids, taking care of his kids. And he'll, if you just touch his kids, and, and God goes, I'm not touching his kids. Read it in the Bible. I'm not touching them. And the devil goes and kills his kids, comes back. Take all his stuff, comes back. Guys, he never gets Job passive in his relationship with God. He tries to use selfishness to get him to passivity so he can kill him. And Job never takes the bait. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Why? He has hope that secures him in the onslaught of the enemy. Here's where I just stop talking. I can talk forever. <laughs> Put the Bible in there. It gets real bad. Here, here, here's where I want us to go. Jesus came to overcome that. And what I would like to do is pray. Then we're going to worship. Molly and I will stand down here. But where there is attack of the enemy to bring destruction, we want to pray for the Lord to break that. We want to pray that the Lord would infuse hope in the midst of very difficult situations that will sustain until the delivering grace of God comes. Is that okay? 
If you don't mind to stand, I'm just going to ask you to stand. You guys listen slow. I thought I'd be along farther than I am right now on what I wanted to share, but... Uh, has it been helpful for anybody just to look? I don't like to look at the devil much, but it's important that we know that he's there and that there's work that's, that's being done in the invisible realm that affects the visible. Maybe somebody in the room that you know going through a tough time. Maybe the enemy is behind it. And uh, just we're in this room together. You, you, why don't you just set a prayer toward them and for them? Lord, would you just release grace for them? Would you release healing for them? God, would you release hope in the midst of hopelessness, please? Well, he said for this purpose, did Jesus come that he might destroy the works of the devil? That the kingdom of darkness comes in like a flood. There is ability beyond our ability and power beyond our power that brings destructiveness into life. We come now joining together, touching this one thing, asking that the power that is in Christ's act on the cross and in his name would be the power in this room today. Father, we pray that the name that's above every name would be the name that brings relief and release over those under the onslaught of the kingdom of darkness. We thank you for Christ. We thank you for what he has done on the cross. We thank you for his name, his blood, his strength, his power. We pray that that would be infused into those in this room right now. May the reality of who God is and what he has done on our behalf be the reality in our hearts. Lord, I pray for everyone in this room that's been lied to by the kingdom of darkness and be being been told naturally and supernaturally that they are worthless and that they are weak and they are bound by their selfishness unto eternity. I pray that you would release the grace that comes from Christ that would release strength. Lord, I pray for those in this room that it just seems like thing upon thing upon thing upon thing is trying to crush them. And I pray that by the grace of your name, that that power would be broken and that you would release strength in life to cause us to understand the value that you have for us and the release of the power of your righteousness over us and in us. May the power of that righteousness release strength and hope and life. It's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, as we worship, if you want prayer, you can come. Oh, no. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest, I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises of God.
standing on the promises of Christ the Lord. Found him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword. Standing on the promises of for those promises, dear Lord. We thank you that you have sustained us through hope. May we carry that promise of hope with us as we go out these doors into your world this week. May we carry that that others may see you in us. Go with us, guide us, bring us back in your safety. Amen.